Hello, I'm Deepak Bhatt from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School here for ACC.org at day two of ESC 2020, virtual. Should have been in Amsterdam. Yeah, well, it is in Amsterdam, but we're covering it virtually. And I'm joined by two good friends today, Dr. Kim Eagle, our editor-in-chief for ACC.org from the University of Michigan, and Dr. Gabriel Steg from Hopital Bichat and the University of Paris. So let's get right into it because just like day one, there's a ton of things to cover here. And perhaps we could start with Voyager PAD. Maybe I'll just say a quick line about that to get us going. So Voyager PAD, of course, is study uh, adding low dose of rivaroxaban to the mix in patients with PAD undergoing lower extremity revascularization. The primary results are immune control medicine. What's presented here are the results for patients with or without concomitant CAD, so-called polyvascular disease. Interestingly, all three of us were involved with the REACH registry, which first popularized that term of polyvascular disease. And what the investigators find is that the strategy of adding uh, the low dose of oroxaban is particularly appealing in patients with large plaque burden, that is polyvascular disease, though it appears to work even in those with isolated PAD. So in a nutshell, a more corroborative, strong data out of Voyager PAD. Uh, let's move on to the next on our hit list here, the BAMI trial. And this, I think, uh, is an important study because of its size, looking at autologous uh, cells and, and what role they might have. And Kim, maybe you could just bring the audience up to speed about what the trial was and what it found. Yeah, I, I do want to congratulate the investigators for doing a larger trial of bone marrow-derived mononuclear cells injected into the coronary of patients who'd suffered a myocardial infarction two to six days before the infusion with the notion that uh, bone metal derived cells might improve inflammation uh, and reduce uh, infarct size and lead to a, a reduction in mortality. And the, the, the trial followed patients out a number of years. Um, there, was, there was no substantial benefit on uh, the primary endpoint in this trial. And I think for me at least, it, it should put to rest the notion that this is a strategy ready for prime time. And we've been doing this for almost 20 years, it seems, but very tiny trials, not limited follow-up. This to me is, is in some ways a more important study because it's larger, longer follow-up, very well done. And I'm not convinced there's a significant benefit. Yeah, I think that's a great summary. Lots of smaller studies done, but I, I also credit the investigators for doing a large bulk power trial. And I also credit them for calling it BAMI. That's a really good acronym in my opinion. Uh, so the next one, I'm not sure how to pronounce, it's either at PCI or ATPCI, but uh, Gabriel, I'll turn to you. You were the chair of the Data Safety Monitoring Board for this study. What was it and what did it show? So this was looking at trimetazidine, which is a an, an antianginal agent that is uh, acting via uh, meta the metabolic pathway, so it's not directly impacting uh, um, heart rate or blood pressure, in fact, has no impact on these. And it's uh, somewhat widely used as an antianginal agent in Europe and other parts of the world. And the question, of course, with antianginal agents is, are they able beyond angina control to affect outcomes? And that was tested in a large population that had just undergone PCI. And uh, to make a long story short, the trial doesn't show any hint of benefit on outcomes uh, from the intervention. It's safe, uh, but it's not effective. And um, I think that's, you know, once more with a new class of anti-angina agents, we have this same story that it's hard to impact outcomes in this population with the anti-angina agents. Yeah, an important study, I think, for our understanding of how best to treat angina nonetheless. So Kim, we'll turn to you. You're a popular sort of guy. Do you want to review popular TAVI? Popular TAVI, uh, a nice randomized trial looking at aspirin plus clopidogrel versus aspirin alone in post-TAVI patients, um, roughly 600 patients randomized. Uh, and really the question was, is aspirin non-inferior to the combination? Uh, and the study suggested that, that bleeding was less as you'd expect if you use aspirin alone. And there was not a substantial increase in concomitant thromboembolic events in the group that got uh, aspirin alone compared to clopidogrel. Uh, so I, I interpret this study to suggest that in patients without, without other indications for dual antiplatelet therapy, that aspirin should be sufficient after TAVR. Yeah, I think that's a really important message that the investigators came out with. So uh, maybe we'll move now, Gabriel, to you for parallax. 
Yeah, so Parallax is a study that's at Sucubitril Valsartan uh, in patients with preserved heart failure. And it's uh, looking essentially at whether we can affect um, NT-ProBNP, uh, quality of life, you measured by the Kansas City questionnaire uh, in, in this population. And the story sort of, sort of gives mixed results. Uh, the effect of Sucubitril Valsartan was there on NT-ProBNP, but it wasn't there on uh, the Kansas City questionnaire and the other markers, uh, the interim, the uh, uh, intermediate uh, outcomes. Now, what's interesting is that when the investigators looked at clinical outcomes, looking at freedom from death or hospitalization related to heart failure, they did find a benefit, but that was a post hoc analysis. So um, maybe if the trial had been designed in reverse, looking at the clinical outcomes first, uh, we would be more yeah. upbeat about this. I think it's a bit disappointing, but still we have to remember that we have no effective therapies for patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. Paragon was tantalizing, being on the cusp of showing benefit. Again, here, Parallax shows some benefit on intermediate markers and a post-hoc analysis that's suggestive of benefit. I think there's something there, but it's, again, not entirely definitive. Yeah, do you agree with that, Kim? I see you nodding your head. Well, I, I do. I, I think the problem with HEF-PEF is that it's such a group of different disorders with ischemia, fibrosis, inflammation, hypertrophy, and until we tease out the phenotypes better, uh, getting pharmacologic benefit in the larger group is going to continue to be a challenge, I think. Yeah, no, I totally agree. It have perhaps a, a tough nut to crack for sure, but you know, at least I think some scientific progress in our understanding of it from this trial. So the final trial that I'll mention is DAPA CKD, which I think is a terrific trial. It is something where a press release or a couple of press releases have been issued. So we uh, know the trial is positive already uh, walking into ESC. And I think it's just more great data for SGLT2 inhibitors as a class. Yesterday we had Emperor, today it's uh, DAPA CKD, and, and it's just a consistency here. SGLT2 inhibitors are good for heart failure related endpoints. As we saw yesterday, they're good for renal endpoints, as we're seeing today. So I, I think as a therapeutic class, this is something that cardiologists need to get familiar with, nephrologists, endocrinologists, primary care as well. And if you look at real world, utilization surveys, the use is pretty low. Some of that may have to do with cost and accessibility, of course, but uh, putting that point aside, the data now are, are really quite uh, overwhelming for these drugs. Well, with that, we better close for day two on deepakbot3acc.org. Please tune into acc.org for journal scans, clinical trial updates, uh, de novo clinical trial coverage, and news summaries. You can really keep up quite nicely remotely with what's going on at ESC 2020 through acc.org. Uh, thank you so much, Kim and Gabriel. To the audience, stay safe out there. Mm -hmm.